Right, my name is Thomas Holmes. I work at Insight Pool, and thank you for coming out. I'm going to be talking about functional reactive programming. Has anybody here heard of functional reactive programming other than me yapping about it while we're drinking? OK, so we got a couple of people. Um, has anybody used functional reactive programming? All right, we got one. <laughs> what do you use? Is this like an event machine? Uh, I use Bacon. Is this about Bacon? Yeah. So. <laughs> you might know more about Bacon itself than me. I've used, I know more about other libraries, but <laughs> this is the most applicable to the group. So what is functional reactive programming? It's got a name whose words we all know, but maybe it doesn't kind of make sense when you pull it together. Wikipedia says that functional reactive programming is a programming paradigm for reactive programming using the building blocks of functional programming. That's not really much better than the monad definition. Um, <laughs> so we're going to go over uh, just these words real quick. Functional. Most of the most of the principle of functional reactive programming, you're building, you're applying the functional principles. You're using small functions. Uh, you get input data goes in, clean data comes out. Uh, you try to keep most of it in the functional sense. We'll touch more on how it's functional later. Uh, next, we have reactive. So instead of writing imperative procedural code, stepping through doing an action, doing a thing, doing another thing, changing this value, instead you set up a system and then it responds as the real world goes on around it. User interaction, other things that other parts of your program trigger, either time-based or explicitly. Uh, so it's all about setting this up and then reacting to it. Because of this, functional reactive programming is very composable. Uh, everything that you do yields another uh, piece of the uh, framework so that you can then combine with more functions and split things off and thread things around. You can have all sorts of these pieces and they just they piece together really nicely, especially in a dynamic language. Because of all that, you end up with fairly concise statements. You're not stringing lots of spaghetti code around or tons of callbacks all over the place. You Again, you set up things in a kind of a declarative model. You lay out your system, this thing happens, then I will split it off like that, then do this thing, then this thing, and then this element on this web page will update. And it's all pretty, pretty small, and then just you kick it off and then things just respond as they should. So before we jump into functional reactive programming, we're going to go over something that hopefully all of you have used, which is the Ruby enumerable module. Uh, hopefully everyone's familiar. Um, functional reactive programming libraries and the enumerable, enumerable module are fairly similar in terms of what they look like, but the way they work is drastically different. So I'm going to go over three slightly small fonted uh, pieces of the enumerable module, map, reduce, and select. And these are kind of some of your functional components. So map. We've got an array with three things in it, cat, dog, and horse. And if you map it with a block, you put fish on the end, you get a catfish, a dogfish, and a horsefish. Never heard of the last one, but uh, that's what happens. And you, the block is essentially an anonymous function. And you end up using either passing first class functions or anonymous functions a lot in functional reactive programming. The second example is just making a lambda, storing it in a variable, and then passing that lambda into the map function. So you're just kind of demonstrating that, yes, with Ruby and the enumerable module, you can also just hand it a function that you wish to run. It doesn't have to just be with the literal block syntax. We've got the same thing for reduce. We're using a special syntax to sum these values. Uh, then we're using a block syntax to sum the values. And then, again, we're making a lambda that is our function to sum the values. And this is just kind of all again showing all of these different ways of calling the enumerable module and its methods in Ruby land that should hopefully be familiar because you're going to see things that look very similar to this once we hit bacon. And finally, select. It just filters things out. Again, we take a list, a range of 1 to 10, and we just keep the evens. And we can do the same thing by making a function or a lambda and then passing it in. Is everyone good so far? All right. So enumerables are what you might call pull-based. When you go to use 
enumerables and their methods, all of the data has to be present, notwithstanding infinite enumerators but, and lazies, but that's only relatively recent. And you might say, this sounds like lazies, and you can, maybe I can get some of this with Ruby lazies. And it's close. It's in the same realm. You've set up a set of operations, and then they run later. But that's more deferred execution, and, re and uh, functional reactive programming is not purely about deferred execution. It's about responding when things happen. Because of this, when you run the code, when you use enumerable module methods, the effects are immediate. Things happen right now. You write that code, the mapping happens, a new array is created, and you've got your output. This leads to very procedural looking code. Every time you want to do something, you have to write it procedurally. You have to do step one, then you have to do step two, and then you have to do step three. And if you ever need to update the element on the page or whatever it is that comes from step three, you have to do all the steps again, or at least enough of them so that you can rerun step three. Do that. So what's another way we can do this? Bacon.js is a JavaScript functional reactive programming library. So all this stuff I've talked about, let's let you do it. There's not a whole lot in the Ruby world around functional reactive programming. Steve Klabnik has written one non-production ready functional reactive programming library called Frappuccino, mostly because it was a really good name. Um, <laughs> And it was with some of the work he was doing with the Shoes Project, if anyone's ever heard of that, which is like a little light UI, easy to use UI framework for Ruby. Functional reactive programming really shines in a user interactive environment. But we're not talking about those. There's also RxJS by Microsoft, which is a port of their reactive extensions framework, which is exceptional in the .NET land. I don't know too much about it in the JavaScript land, though. So in BaconJS, there's a couple terms we need to go over. Uh, really just two primary terms. They're very important. They're the core on which all of this is built. The first is a property. Other frameworks might call this a behavior or maybe like an attribute or a subject. Uh, but it basically represents one value. And this is a value that can change over time. If you think about a spreadsheet program, for example, each one of those cells is like a property. You can have cell A1 and put the value 10 in it. And you can have cell B1 and put the value 20 in it, and then say C, or, uh, C1 and say that equals A1 plus B1, and it says it's 30. All of those are equivalent to a bacon JS property. If you change either A1 or B1, C1 all of a sudden has the new sum in it. You didn't have to do any extra work. You've kind of declaratively set up the system, and then you get the end result. It stays up to date. The second item in BaconJS, the second term or concept, is an event stream, where a property is kind of pinned to the most recent event in time, and it, and it holds onto that. An event stream is just sort of a, a variable or an object that represents like the pipeline that the uh, events travel through. So every time, and this is closest to like an event, like just a native event you might have in the DOM when you subscribe to anything, clicking a button or whatever. Whenever this action happens, uh, an event notice or arguments or whatever come through the pipe. And then at which point you can hook other things up to the end of the event stream. You can put maps on the end of it. You can put filters. You can reduce. You can do all kinds of really, basically anything you can think of and probably some things you've never thought of before if you've never used functional reactive programming. So the main emphasis in functional reactive programming is values contrasted like and displayed and tracked over time. This lets you kind of treat these things that are connected to the real world in a functional sense because you're not having to go back and do these things over again. You're not really storing and managing this external side effect driven state. You've got this one thing that's not getting mutated exactly. It just it is a sliding window. It's got like an extra dimension that variables typically don't have. So here's a very first example. Make that a little bit bigger. Um, and this is very, very simple. But we've got a field up here at the top. It's just a little span with a zero in it. We've got a button that's got a plus one on it. Uh, and now I have to find a function add. It just takes two arguments, adds them together, returns it. Um, okay. And now I have this variable plus, And I'm using jQuery here. So I'm grabbing 
the element with the ID of plus zero, which is actually this plus one button. They have a zero at the end of them because I have like three slides and all the slides are defined in the same HTML file. So like I can't run over the IDs. It's a little weird, but anyway, this is plus zero, not because of the plus one, but because it's the first one. So, and zero indexing is the only way to be. Um, so I identify that element. If you have jQuery or Zepto, Bacon hooks into both of them to provide this as event stream function. Um, so I'm saying, give me that, that button. Now I want to get as an event stream, the click event. And if you just cut it off at that point, um, if you exclude the map, plus will be an event stream that every, where every time you click, it'll send the click event arguments through the stream. I don't care about the click event arguments. I just want to know that it happened. So now I am, I'm mapping. I don't need to pass it a function because I don't care. I don't want to do anything with it. I just want to turn it into a one. Every time you click the button, a one comes through the stream. Now I make another variable called total. And that, equal, that starts from the event stream that is just ones now that represents a one every time you click. And then we're going to scan over it. And scan is basically the bacon.js terminology for reduce or inject. It will aggregate over everything that comes through. So we start with a zero of initial value, and then we apply the add function. And it'll apply it to the existing state, the, the current state of the value, and the newest event that's come through. So every time we click the button, we're going to get a one through. And then total is a property that is going to then be one, then two, then three, then four, then five. And it'll always be whatever the current value is. But you can't use it directly. It has to either be incorporated into other bacon.js properties or event streams or used like a promise to extract the value. Because it, it itself isn't the value. It represents the value. So that's what we do in this last line. We now say total dot assign, which basically says whenever total is changed, we're going to find span 0, which is that 0 right now at the top of the screen. And we're going to update its text field. So that's a lot of words just to make a number go up. But it's not very much code. Um, but also, we've gotten to the bottom of here. We've not actually done anything yet. We've, we've created a, and specified a system wherein clicking this one button changes this one value. So it's pretty small. But you know, we click it, and it's wonderful. It goes up. This is amazing. Um, <laughs> this is obviously like really trivial to do with a little bit of sprinkle on JS and jQuery and you know, whatever. But if you need to you know, do more than one button, and you need to do lots of buttons, and maybe there's like more than one way to increment this value, and maybe it's not just an integer, this kind of thing starts to uh, give you a lot more power in how you manage that. Now we're doubling it up. So now we got a plus one and a minus one button. Same kind of thing. Here we've got the var plus, which is now grabbing plus one as event stream, click, and mapping it to one. Now we've got another event stream, the minus, and it maps to minus one. If I wanted to be more clever and less uh, explicit, I could have either appended some data onto the elements themselves or looked at the content of the button and figured out it was plus one and minus one, used a more intelligent map, and you know, not split it out. But I wanted to be really clear. So anyway, I've created two event streams, one for incrementing, one for decrementing. Then I'm going to merge them, which is a pretty crucial concept. Um, so I take this one event stream, and I say, I'm going to merge it with minus. So it makes a new, brand new event stream and returns it. And it's basically the two event streams multiplexed together. So it's going to just be plus ones and minus ones coming out. And we assign that. Then we scan over that new multiplexed event stream. And then we assign it to the span. So are, there, are they still completely, I mean, is there any implied order in processing of those two streams? Well. JavaScript is single threaded, so you've got that. Right. Um, basically, the ordering is the order in which the events are pushed onto the originating streams. Okay. So if an event, if we were in like threaded world and and uh, an event got pushed onto plus before an event got pushed onto minus, it'll come through the merged in that order too. Okay. Um, it wouldn't matter if you reversed your merge statement. So no. Minus yeah. merge plus. Yeah, it would be equivalent either way. You just Got to pick one to start. Okay. So we can increase and decrease. No. Pretty straightforward. 
So now I've got, let's see if I can make that just a smidge bigger. Great. All right, so now I've got two color blocks here. They're both black right now. Um, and I've got two color pickers, which are really un unexciting. I wanted some really fancy color pickers when you can like drag around really fast, but I didn't want my code example to be like this big. Um, so this is the best that you get in Chromium with HTML5 input. Um, so they're both black. And before we look at the code, the first one is additive, so it combines colors like light. So if I change this first color to red, what do you think we're going to get in both of these boxes? The second one is SAS mixing, which is kind of like gradient mixing or what you might expect to happen if you like average two colors. A dark red? Yes, yeah, so you'll get bright red in the additive and like a burgundy dark red in the SAS mixing. And then we can change color two and make it blue. And again, we'll get magenta and a plumish color. So that's working in a similar way to the other ones, but we're not really working with an event stream as much. We are creating a property out of the first color picker, and we're creating a property out of the second color picker. Now we're using this new function that we haven't seen yet until this slide, which is bacon.combine with. And combined with, you can pass it other bacon elements. In this case, I'm passing it both color one and color two, which are properties. Normally, you can't just access the, the property itself. You can't just say, oh, property, what's your value? And it'll tell you, you know, purple. It can't do that. You can use it like a promise, but it won't just tell you its value straight up. But if you use these other property creating functions, like combined with, we're going to give it mix additive which is a function that's defined not in the view here. It's pretty boring. It just adds the colors together. Um, and we pass it color one and color two. It'll pass the actual values of color one and color two, so like 255.00 and 00.255 into the mix additive function. It'll do what it does, then return the answer back out in the form of a new property. And then we assign it to the CSS background color of the first div. And then we do the same with the second one using a different method. So. Hopefully you're starting to see like how you can you know build these things where you've got this live data. It's it's always connected. I'm not having to write code every time or call something else if, if this changes and then update it. And you know I have two colors here, but what if I really had like ten inputs to control this? I mean it starts to get messy, especially if you have to recompute pieces. And you know you could build dependent trees and structures out of this data as composed of these two things, which mixes mixes with this thing, and with properties, you can change the guy at the bottom and it'll cascade up and fix everything and recompute the right amount of stuff that needs to be done. So now, what else can you do with it? So that was kind of, you know, there was nothing too amazing there. It was just, I mean, it's cool, it's pretty brief, everything's short and nice, and you don't have to like keep recalling things whenever you change it, it makes the page kind of live. But we can do some more things. You can make your own event streams. So you can send events through an event stream for anything you want in the world. You can just make up a new one. I think uh, I believe they call it a bus. And you can just push stuff onto it. You know, you want to uh, set up like an autosave function or something on your web page. You could have several event streams where one gets triggered when the page user tries to leave the page. Maybe one gets triggered when they're idle for five minutes. You can use BaconJS to create an event stream that'll fire every like five minutes. You know, you can do stuff like that. Um, a save button. So you can have all these different event streams that are independently useful, maybe without thinking about the save feature. But then you could say, oh, we need, we need a save feature, an auto save feature. You can snag, snag these different event streams, merge them in together, and then just trigger you know, your auto save feature off of the composite of those things without having really originally planned on integrating them together. And this one's really nice. You can flatten out Ajax responses into event streams as well. So instead of having to play the sort of the promise callback jump around game all over the place and trying to be in the right place, you can actually pump them through an event stream and then just get them coming through nicely on one layer rather than having to kind of leap around. And so I've got an example of that. So I've got a text field here that might be representative of maybe you're like signing up a username on a forum and it wants to check your username on the server, see if it's available and tell you. Or maybe you're on Stack Overflow or somewhere else, and you're typing in you know, words to search, and it wants to suggest, oh, well, these things are kind of like that, or spell checking your examples. So we could type some things in here. So I could type like CA, and then right there, it's 
bounced off to a Sinatra server that's running on my computer. So not really over there, just right here. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's responded back with just a little JSON response. It says, hey, you searched for CA. Here are the things that I found in your dictionary words file that start with CA. This is really naive, but the point is it's round trip data. The same Excuse me? They're the same recommendation. Right, so that one's just slow. <laughs> oh, okay. Wait, so I've got one event stream that's being pushed through when you type in the box, and then it gets split off into two other sets of code. One of them hits an endpoint that's configured to wait randomly between a half second and three seconds, okay. and the other one returns immediately. Um, so when you're using a well-featured functional reactive programming library, not only do you get these basics of event stream management, uh, but they also have a lot of really nice built-in tools like <coughs> throttling, buffering, debouncing, um, and other things like that. So I'm debouncing 200 milliseconds. So it means if I'm, if I'm in here just like typing, you know, it's, and as long as I'm changing it, it's not going to look unless I stop for um, 200 milliseconds, and then it'll start looking. So I can go like C, D. You see that one? Saying that would be really cool pattern to have, like a fast recommendation and then like the in-depth like search. Yeah, and you can you can rig those up. Um, That'd be cool. And it, it plays really nicely. There's some other things. So this uses flat mapping, which you end up getting an event stream of event streams, which are your answers. And then you flat map them out, so you just get the events. And you can also, there, I'll go to the next page with the code. So how do we do it? This is, this is a little dense. It could probably be refactored a little bit better, but I didn't want to go crazy on it. Um, so we get the input. So every time your key comes up inside of that input text box, we create an event that is just the value in the text box at this time. Then we. We do a debounce on that input, so it'll only take the things after like 200 seconds of elapsed of non-activity. So we don't do more than like we don't we don't spam the server with all these inputs that we don't care about. If you're typing 100 words a minute, you don't care about the suggestions from nine characters ago, because uh, you know your round trip time is probably not three milliseconds like it is on a local box. Um, so now we're going to flat map, and the flat map we're going to flat map over the words that come out of the original stream the input box, and we're going to do return a bacon from promise, and then the jQuery AJAX call against my endpoint to get the data. And bacon from promise returns an event stream that will have the response from the promise once the promise is satisfied. So this lets us just say, oh, here's an event stream. And then once those calls come back, once they complete and the server responds, those values will just get pushed through. It's great. Um, and I forgot to update this. There's actually a flat map latest that I'm actually using in the code. This one is not the actual running code. The previous examples were the actual running code on the page. Um, I don't know what flat map does. Oh, so that's, that's actually coming up on the very next slide. Um, so we're just going to go over quick, and then we're going to talk more about how it actually works. So anyway, we get flat uh, web suggestions is now just an event stream that will have you know arrays in it that say, like, It'll have like in it CA, Cab, Cabal, Cabana, Cabaret. And then you know when I change it to D, it'll push another thing through it that says D, Dab, Dabbing, Dabble, Dabble, et cetera. Um, we take those, and then we just, uh, we're going to map those out to extract the string from the JSON response, turn it into a property again, and assign it to just a div there. Realistically, you would probably maybe want to do something more clever with it and style it up and make it all fancy and selectable, but I mean, the data is there. The rest of it's for some front end guy. Um, <laughs> which, which, I, here, which I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so flat map. Um, flat map exists in Ruby World too, uh, but it's probably not quite as used as normal map. So take a step back and look at the Ruby flat map. So flat map, all it does is go over all of the items that are in an enumerable sequence and remove like one layer of, of arrays. So it turns an array that has the array 1, 2 and the array 3, 4 into just the array 1, 2, 3, 4. So flat. Flat. I think it's what it is. So, so it's map and then flat. flat. Yeah. You it's can also map and flat. Yeah. 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 yeah, you can also just call flat. Um, yeah. I call, I use flat map there. But. Or bind in the list monad. 
Yes. <laughs> FRP is pretty monady. Yeah. Um, so there's actually a pretty strong parallel here. Um, you can think of event streams like arrays or anything that's enumerable, and you can kind of think of properties like variables, except in FRP world, they're alive, they're living. When things change, they up to date. They keep up to date, their values change, because they represent not just a value, but they have two dimensions that represent them, both time and a value. And you can actually get like the times and other stuff through your event streams as well if you care, but you probably don't. Most. So then there was another thing I used from Promise. And that'll take any normal conforming promise and it'll automatically unwrap it. You've also got the option to do from callback where you can use an arbitrary callback. You pass it in a function that gives you a function and then you call your answer with that function and you can rig it up the same way. You can also, uh, oops, so that lets you turn an event stream, a promise into an event stream. So, BaconJS integrates with jQuery, Zepto, node callbacks, uh, general promises, and the proper node event emitter. I can't tell you anything about node because I don't do node, but um, it supports it pretty easily. It says things like throttle and debounce, which are pretty close to the same thing. Buffer, which lets you do things like uh, buffer for half a second, and then it'll push through the event stream and like in an array everything that came in in the last half second, or you could say, you know, I'd like to buffer 100 items, so you can process things in batches of 100. You could delay events, you know, if something certain, a certain uh, event happens, you know, you can buffer and then delay it whatever amount of time you might want to. You can do sliding windows to where if you push one, two, and three through an event stream, you get one and two, and then you get two and three, and then you get three and four, which can be useful in implementing certain kinds of things. And then, like we saw in a couple other examples, merging, where you just get to take two separate event streams jam them together, and then you get one derived event stream that's based off of the originals. And when you have these kind of tools, that really lets you have the extreme composability that you get in FRP. Every one of these functions returns another event stream or a property. You keep chaining them, and you can break them off at any time you want to. So you can have one event stream that is like all of your mouse movement on your page. And, but that could be down like at a low level, it could be wrapped in something, but then you could expose three other event streams that are like, while dragging, mouse movements while dragging, mouse movements over this area, mouse movements over in that area, and they could all be based on the same origin event stream, but then just sliced up by saying, oh, while dragging is mouse events while something, and this is while this and while that, and by mapping and filtering and doing all these other things. So you just keep composing and spreading outwards, and it just flows. To incorporate bacon in your project, you can get it with NPM. It exports via AMD convention. And it also adds the bacon variable to window. So it's pretty much usable anywhere without any hassle. It also works basically everywhere. It does not do anything UI specific. You can check their page, but it supports IE6 and like Safari and iPhones and everything. Like if you can run JavaScript, you can probably run bacon. Uh, making your web page look pretty is a different problem. Um, but it should and does pretty much work everywhere. And that's it. Will you take questions? Sure. I also made a little paint app, but I didn't get to do as much cool stuff with it as I wanted to. But it's really easy with like flat map and a couple other events. Show us the code, though. Cool. <laughs> That's not quite two lines. <laughs> so it's the next step to implement like the turtle programming language. <laughs> Could be. So it's got some extra stuff, and I started doing some things in here that aren't actually working right now, like swapping out brushes and stuff, and swapping out brush size, because it's all, again, really easy to do by using properties and mixing things into the event streams. So this starts out by getting the, the canvas, uh, Great stuff. Then I make a couple functions. Two point, two chords, those are for converting the events, the mouse events that come through. Then I've got a function called draw path, which just makes my stroke between two points. Totally don't have a functional chisel tip right now. Because I need to change the way I draw so it's replaceable. So now, um, is this big enough? Can everyone kind of see? Should I make it bigger? 
Huh? I can see it. Okay. So then we've got an event stream called canvas movement, which is just a mouse move event over the canvas. Then points, where I map that point method that was higher up, which will just convert it to a JavaScript object that just has an X and a Y. I don't care about all the other stuff. This isn't perfectly portable because apparently the browsers don't like to do their offsets in a consistent way. But it works on Chromium, so that's all I care about right now. Um, oops. And I'm hitting buttons. OK. So that gives me an event stream of points that I can work with. Then I get my mouse down events over the canvas. And then I get my mouse up events anywhere on the browser. Because if you drag off the side and let go, you'll keep dragging when you come back onto it, and that would suck. Mm -hmm. um, then we, up here, we then map the points to coordinates. And then we assign that value to this little span that's down here underneath. Just you can see that updates like as I mouse around. Like so it's not doing very much work, but the structure's pretty fast. So it's not like it updates pretty quickly. Um, then I make a property for the color, similar to like was in the color example. And that's driven off this right here, so I can change this guy to like purple. And now we're drawing purple. Hmm. And then I assign that. Oh, I assign that color to something that actually doesn't exist any. Oh no, it's right underneath the coordinates. I also have the hash code of the color right down here. But when you did that two property on the on forty one, is that just setting the default value? Yeah, that's setting the initial value until it's gotten a value. Okay. So I just want it to start as black. Then I assign it down to that span down there, so we can just kind of look at it. Now here's kind of the interesting part. Uh, I'm actually defining my brush earlier. I've got a bacon constant, which makes a property also out of the thing that already exists, draw path, which calls up to that draw function that we saw up higher, which is just on interesting canvas stuff, picking two points and stroking a line. Um, so the interesting piece right here is basically lines 47 through 49. Uh, that's more or less where all the work happens. Uh, mouse down, can we flat map over that, which means we then take this function and we generate a sliding window of points over the mouse positions while we have the mouse down. While we have the mouse down, we're basically pushing event stream to event, an event stream of an event stream. Well, we've got an event stream, and then we're pushing another event stream into it that has all of our mouse movements. And that'll keep going until you release the mouse button, at which point that inner mouse button, that inner event stream will finish, and then it'll stop pushing values through until you press the mouse button down again. And then the sliding window always gives me the, the two chunks, so I can draw a line between two points. Um, and that's 99% of the magic. Um, down here, this bar draw me and bacon combine template is kind of like uh, the bacon combine with, but on steroids. And I pass into it points and color and brush, and I just can jam a whole bunch of properties into it. And as any one of them changes, it'll reevaluate the function. So can you go over that one more time? Because I, I get the gist of what you're saying, right? You're using this flat map sliding window mm -hmm. in order to grab all the points and then pair them up, right? Mm -hmm. So that you can write, make little segments between each point. Yep. So so how does the sliding window 2, 2 index okay. so, do that? So points, if you remember, is up here. And it is canvas movement. So that's all the coordinates converted to just point notation. So an x and a y. So whenever the mouse is down, there will be an event that comes through the mouse down. So while it's doing that, it's flat mapping. Um, that'll push one thing through. For every one of those, basically the mouse down event, when you hit mouse down, it will push one thing onto the mouse down um, event stream. We'll then flat map that value, which we don't really care about. We discard it. And we then return out the event stream that is a sliding window that terminates once the mouse is released. And, and the, sli the sliding window two comma two, what's the, where are the two? So comma? that will give me, um, uh, I forget what both the arcs mean, but basically it means give me a sliding window that is of two size. Okay, so it's the... Yeah, it'll give me, yeah, you know, uh, well, x0, y0, and x1 and y1. Then it'll give me x1 and y1 and x2 and y2. So is it literally a array? 
Um, there's a couple ways you can get it, but you can either get it past you as an array, and there's also some plural forms of the mapping where it'll pass them to you and it'll like flatten, it'll expand the array and pass them as individual args. Um, I think we have like less broadcast people. Yeah. And so, and that, that inner one just keeps pushing stuff onto the flat mapped enumerable until you mouse up and then it completes the event stream. Um, and event streams do have a concept of being finished, of ending. They don't have to end, but they do have a concept of ending. And then you can do certain things when they end or when they error. You can have other subscribers. Um, and then draw me is where that's put. Not to change gears, but the question mm -hmm. I have is oh. yeah. um, testing. Obviously, that's important to a lot of Rubyists. It is. Um, how so does it affect this? Depending on how and where you integrate it um, and the library, they have different testing stories. I haven't researched a ton into Bacon's testing story. Um, depending on how complicated it is, and if you don't do a lot of things that are like heavily time-based, you can just push things in and then subscribe and check that you got the right answer coming back out in any of the JavaScript testing frameworks that support asynchronous testing. Um, in the, this doesn't really help any of you guys any, but in the, probably, in the .NET world, Microsoft has made reactive extensions, which is a very well designed uh, functional reactive programming framework. And you actually, they actually have a whole testing library that's is surrounded around sort of controlling time and thread synchronization that makes testing this stuff really great. Um, but I don't think Bacon has any explicit things to help you test other than you being able to push things onto your events. Maybe Luigi can speak more about that if he's tested any Bacon JS code specifically. Uh, I think we just use I think we just use um, what's the Mocha, Jasmine, that's Jasmine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you just break it, it's very small, uh, it's very functional. So yeah. you just test it in your building units. We, we don't do it here. Yeah, and all of this stuff is can be passed around. Like all of your um, event streams and properties can be passed around. So if things take in an event stream as an argument in a testing scenario, you can just make a bus or whatever and pass it in, then push things onto it, and then see that they did the right thing. Um, but it can be it can be tricky to to test it if you've built a really big so you system. Can, you can just uses. choose to test it. It's like stuff went in. Okay, now it's done, and right. the output is what I expected. Yeah. So you'll have to kind of yeah. I don't think there's good guidelines for how to test it in the bacon world, at least. Other than you do end up mm -hmm. building a lot of these small functions that you can you can assert that they do the right thing. Right. And then you can add a higher it's level. It's almost a fallback to it's correct because it has to be correct. Right. In, in a lot of ways. not wrong. Yeah. So that's the gist of it. And then here's, you know, on value, which is subscribe for any kind of invented system. When a value comes through, call this function with the argument. And that's the end of it. I have a question. So my question is kind of uh, vague. But uh, okay. so I've, I've done enough programming with Backbone JS to be extremely dangerous, but a lot of this kind of reminds me of the stuff that I can do with Backbone, where you know I'm setting up events and having different behaviors happening on based on events. How would you kind of relate how Bacon is used versus like Backbone, or is like really Bacon something that could be? It seems like something like Bacon be something like that could actually Backbone yeah. could utilize. Yeah. As, yeah, a, the, the as, big, a, as a framework for right. event handling. Right, and there are, there are systems that you know, emulate some of this style of stuff. Um, the big boon in an FRP library is usually the rich, the composability and the rich mm -hmm. um, set of base functions. Right. Um, and that becomes even more important in statically typed languages where you can't just push everything around all willy-nilly. Um, but I'm not, I don't really know very much about Backbone, so I can't speak to it directly, but. Yeah, okay. some of the basic examples you showed, the, Angular does the same thing, yeah. like the binding and stuff like that. But yeah. I think that where I think that where it appears as though the real strength comes in is when you're kind of you're chaining the stuff together. Yeah. Because it's Angular, for example, is extremely opinionated. Yeah. As soon as you go outside of the training wheels, it's like, oh my god. Yeah, it's it, it is, and it's about when you can chain it and compose it. Also, it's harder to show an example that doesn't involve you know DOM and UI element stuff, where there's other tools that do that kind of thing. But like Bacon and other FRP frameworks also really shine in building evented systems that are moving 
and managing data in the back end that don't have you know pretty pictures right. or colors to show. Sure. Um, I used to do desktop application development in C Sharp and use a lot of reactive extensions, and it's wonderful and anything at all where you're dealing with any kind of time-centric data, anything that needs to be live, or anything that's based around user input. The, unfortunately, the easiest examples to show are the, the visual DOM-based ones. Uh, and there are other tools that do that kind of thing with data binding in Angular, Ember, or, or Backbone, or whatever. But it's, it is, comes down to when you need to compose and split things and actually you know, fork these streams off in all kinds of different directions and have all that flexibility. you have a question, Patrick? Well, yeah, I was just going to say, have you looked at the source of the Microsoft, is it R Rx library in Ruby? It's a little abominable. It is terrible. Yeah. I hope no one's worked on it here. It's, <laughs> it's like, it's like, I think it's like 15,000 lines in one file. They dumped it in there. <laughs> like, it's like terrible. Some, someone just like, I think they probably used a tool to auto-generate it or something. Yeah, it does look um, like that. Yeah. The library in .NET world is, is really very nice, other than the fact that they do use math characters, so it's kind of hard to... Oh, like Unicode? No, well, yeah, like, you know, pi and p and oh, that's crazy. stuff like that for when they are representative characters. Um, they've got a lot of really, <laughs> Microsoft has a lot of really smart functional math and computer science researchers. So they've developed the idea a lot, but it did originate, I think, in Pascal like 20 years ago or something. You know, you can do that in Ruby. You can use like kanji to represent functions. So you can use like the calendar icon to return your calendar object or something. <laughs> Sounds like a good way to make everybody that comes after you mad. <laughs> Someone was very bored. <laughs> so how did you come across this? Was it just through reactive extensions and you were looking for something for JavaScript or what? Um, so I probably like kind of a mix. Like I'd heard of Bacon from somewhere. I forget. Maybe Andy told me about it. Because I talked to him about functional reactive programming in general several times before. And then he used Bacon for something. and. I don't know. I kind of have just played with it a little bit, but that's probably one of the biggest things I miss about .NET world going to you know Ruby stuff is that the Ruby community doesn't really embrace FRP style stuff, but it also comes along a lot more um, in either heavily evented systems or in asynchronous systems because it really does make concurrent work a lot easier. It kind of a lot of the problems just kind of melt away just by virtue of how you define the systems, because you define the interactions and the values over time, because you're cognizant of that extra definition, rather than, oh, I'm just all over the place poking values in, and that, that's just a recipe for suffering. Kurt? Yeah, have you tried just pointing a web socket at it? Can you just yeah. do that for an event? Yeah. Well, you would have to probably write a tiny piece of glue code that would then take your frame that came through the web socket and push it onto an event stream, but you could certainly do that. And prefer to authenticate data on the stream. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this definitely would be great for that. And like, unless you've got something more like better and specific, like a library in mind, probably the first thing I would do when going to WebSockets would be to put a big and event stream in front of it. So I'm trying. To, so what's the difference between reactive programming versus event-driven programming? To me, it's really the same thing based on the code that I saw. So it's, it's nothing that new. Is there a difference that I'm missing? Uh, it's really it's the probably same more thing, animal. right? It's all event-driven. It it's probably going to be somewhat of a... I don't have a strong opinion between the two. I think of slightly different things when I think of them. But I don't know if I've really done a whole lot of stuff that maybe is what you consider like evented programming. Some of these terms are a little loaded. Right. And you know, there's also there's, there's hardly anything new in computer science anyway. I mean, this is also like 20 plus years old. So, um, not this library, but the concepts. Yeah. But um, my guess is that there's some research. This came out of a research group, yeah. and there's some formal properties of what they say yeah. this sort of system should have. Yeah, there. An event-based system may not have all of this. Yeah. Well, this is without knowledge. I, I can't think so of a specific thing. I was reading briefly about it. They thought the response times tend to be more defined. They're shorter. But it's just a specialization of really. I, I think really there's the of one of them is a set subset of the other. I don't right. know which. Probably, yeah. It's actually, this has to be a subset. Because well, fundamentally, this is talking about event streams. Yeah. So it's yeah. Fundamental. Yeah. But there's more. There's more stuff like right. the concept of properties and other right. things like that too. So it's. They're not exactly the same. They are. They are very much. You know, 
in the same area. Um, functional reactive programming is specified in papers, um, but they end fairly simply in terms of you know computer science papers, fairly simply. But there have been challenges in implementing it gracefully. But well, it's it looks like we kind of got it figured. Also, there's, hmm? there's another area where it could very well be different is the functional aspect because that carries a whole load of mathematical definitions of what makes yeah. it functional, like no side effects and all these mm -hmm. other rules. Yeah, and so you kind of encapsulate, like the whole thing is kind of monadic because you have the whole aspect of time as being a secondary axis along which all of your values exist, which is not something you have normally. So. Hey. Uh, speaking of complications, so I've played with this before, and the heart actually I've wasted a lot of time trying to implement one of these. The biggest complication I hit was when you try to unsubscribe from these event streams. So what, what does it look like in Bacon, like the equivalent of removing an event? Um, I believe you get a token back that you execute that just unsubscribes you. So, like, for instance, when you merge two event streams, like the result of that merge that was similar event streams. Well, that's not a subscription, really. That's... But so, doesn't it end up having to basically add listeners onto each of those streams that get called? So like eventually you have to start running down memory leak? Um, well, there's nothing there that should be leaking memory, really. I mean, you haven't done anything to leak memory. You've just connected some things. Well, I'm envisioning like a scenario where, you know, each time the user logs on or something, right, if something shows up and it well, attaches some listeners onto this button. And then maybe it goes away, and that happens. Yeah. By that would be more like in the subscribe flow, and then you you unsubscribe when you're done. Merging, you know, is not typically something that you're like mutating. You you merge together these streams, and then you subscribe, and then like that's it. And then you unsubscribe when you're done. Um, I'm not specifically certain on how Bacon manages it, but as long as should at least be as long as the parent is in scope, then all that stuff is still alive and still doing things, and you would just go all the way down until you until you bust it, but I'm not completely certain how all of it works the whole way down in terms of when all the memory's freed and what keeps all these streams alive. Partially speaking to your problem, well, maybe. Bacon also has the concept of buses, which are an event stream that you can manage, but instead of merging, you can actually plug an event stream into it. And it gives you a token to unplug it as well. So you can have like a, you can have like a big you know, main, main stream and then, like you said, you could, you know, plug your user stream into it. It could, you know, do stuff while he's around, and then you could unplug him once he's gone, or once a certain part of your UI is gone, or whatever. So that kind of gives you some of that. But it's entirely possible that you could do enough crazy stuff to leak memory. That is almost one of that is certainly a guarantee in computer science. <laughs> <laughs> do you know of any uh, applications that are used in this introduction manager? Uh, I don't know about bacon just specifically. Flutter. Flutter? Yep. Like <laughs> Slack and HipChat and Campfire and all those others. But So one of the things that's always a pain that I run into in some of the systems I have to design and build is ridiculous forms. Is there a way to use bacon to make forms less painful? It depends on what about them is painful to you, but... If it's about responding to stuff the user's done, probably save. almost certainly. There's never a save. It's here just sure. typing. Yeah, you could do that kind of thing with like throttling or debouncing and watching when the forms get edited and push all of merge all of those events together and jam it off into something else to then, you know, post the save of your partial form data somewhere or save it to local storage or really whatever it is that you can come up with. But if you don't need the customization, you might be better off using though, something like an Angular or an Ember though, with that. Yeah, yeah there, there are probably you know, already cooked implementations that are going to manage your form saving if you don't need anything special or really fancy. Yeah. But if you want to understand what's going on and have fine-grained control, right. Bacon is certainly a capable tool for responding to stuff happening in the UI. Yeah. Is that it? Sweet. We hope you've enjoyed this video presentation of a talk given at a monthly Atlanta Ruby Users Group meeting. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. As an Atlanta-based Rails consultancy, Rietta transforms high-level business problems into technical solutions. For more videos like this one, please see the ATL RUG videos playlist.